Fergus Hume. Chapter Fourteen. Treasure Trove. I beg your pardon, sir," said Mrs. Banker to the newcomer. "But I do hope I'm not. Why?" She changed her tone to one of extreme surprise. "If it ain't Mister Wilson." The man did not move a muscle. Ware, who was watching, was disappointed. At least he expected him to start, but the so-called Wilson was absolutely calm, and his voice did not falter. "'You are making a mistake. My name is Franklin.' "'It isn't his voice,' muttered the landlady, still staring. "'But his eyes are the same.' "'May I ask you to go?' said Franklin. "'You are trespassing.' Mrs. Banker shook her rusty black bonnet. "'You may change your hair from red to black,' she declared, "'and you may shave off a ginger beard, but you can't alter your eyes. Mr. Wilson, you are, and that I'll swear to in a court of law before a judge and jury. Let them say what they will about me being a liar. Of what are you talking, woman?' "'Of you, sir.' and i hope i may mention that you were more respectful when you boarded with me boarded with you franklin stared and spoke in an astonished tone why i never boarded with you in my life oh mr wilson how can you what about my little house in lambeth and the dear boy my son alexander you were so fond of you are raving i'm as sane as you are said the landlady, her colour rising. And a deal more respectable, if all were known. Why, you should deny me to my face is more than I can make out, Mr. Wilson. My name is not Wilson. And I say it is, sir. Both the man and the woman eyed one another firmly. Then Franklin motioned Mrs. Banker to a seat on a mossy bank. We can talk better sitting, said he. I should like an explanation of this. You say that my name is Wilson, and that I boarded with you. At Lambeth? I'll take my oath to it. Had your boarder red hair and a red beard? Red as a tomato. But you can buy wigs and false beards. Eyes, as I say, you cannot change. Had this Wilson eyes like mine? Asked Franklin eagerly. "'There ain't a scrap of difference, Mr. Wilson. "'Your eyes are the same now as they were then.' "'One moment. "'Had this man you think me to be two teeth missing in his lower jaw, two front teeth?' "'He had. "'Not that his teeth were of the best.' "'Franklin drew down his lip. "'You will see that I have all my teeth.' "'Hm!' "'Mrs. Banker sniffed. "'Paul's teeth can be bought.' "'I fear you would find these teeth only too genuine,' said the man quietly. "'But I quite understand your mistake.' "'My mistake?' Mrs. Banker shook her head vehemently. "'I'm not one to make mistakes.' "'On this occasion you have done so. "'But the mistake is pardonable. "'Mrs. Mrs. What is your name?' "'Mrs. Banker, sir, and you know it. "'Excuse me, I do not know it. "'The man who was your lodger, and whom you accuse me of being, is my brother.' "'Your brother?' echoed the landlady, amazed. "'Yes, and a bad lot he is. "'Never did a hand's turn in all his life. "'I dare say while he was with you he kept the most irregular hours.' "'He did, most irregular. "'Out all night at times and in all day.' and again out all day and in for the night you describe him exactly mrs banker peered into the clean-shaven face in a puzzled manner your hair is black your voice is changed and only the eyes remain my brother and i have eyes exactly the same i guessed your mistake when you spoke i assure you i am not my brother well sir said the woman beginning to think she had made a mistake after all i will say your voice is not like his it was low and soft while yours 
if you'll excuse me mentioning it is hard and not at all what i call a love voice grim as franklin was he could not help laughing at this last remark i quite understand you only confirm what i say my brother has a beautiful voice mrs banker and much harm he has done with it amongst your sex he never harmed me said mrs banker bridling i am a respectable woman and a widow with one son but your brother he's a blackguard interrupted franklin hand in glove with the very worst people in london you may be thankful he did not cut your throat or steal your furniture lord cried mrs banker astounded was he that dangerous he is so dangerous that he ought to be shut up and if i could lay hands on him i'd get the police to shut him up he's done no end of mischief now i dare say he had a red cross dangling from his watch-chain yes he had what does it mean i can't tell you but i'd give a good deal to know he has hinted to me that it is the sign of some criminal fraternity with which he is associated i never could learn what the object of the cross is he always kept quiet on that subject but i have not seen him for years and then only when i was on a flying visit from italy have you been to italy sir i live there said franklin at florence i have lived there for over ten years with an occasional visit to london if you still think that i am my brother i can bring witnesses to prove lord sir i don't want to prove nothing now i look at you and hear your voice i do say as i made a mistake as i humbly beg your pardon for but you are so like mr wilson i know and i forgive you but why do you wish to find my brother he has been up to some rascality i suppose he has though what it is i know no more than a babe but they do say added mrs banker sinking her voice as the police want him i'm not at all astonished he has placed himself within the reach of the law a hundred times if the police come to me i'll tell them what i have told you no one would be more pleased than i to see walter laid by the heels is his name walter yes walter franklin although he chooses to call himself wilson my name is george he is a blackguard oh sir you're flesh and blood he's no brother of mine said franklin rising with a snarl i hate the man he had traded on his resemblance to me to get money and do all manner of scoundrelly actions that was why i went to italy it seems that i did wisely for i could not prove that i have been abroad these ten years you would swear that i was walter oh no sir really mrs banker rose also nonsense you swore that i was walter when we first met take a good look at me now so that you may be sure that i am not he i don't want to have his rascalities placed on my shoulders mrs banker took a good look and sighed you're not him but you're very like may i ask if you are twins sir no our eyes are the only things that we have in common we got those from our mother who was an italian i take after my mother and am black as you see me my brother favoured my father who was as red as an autumn sunset he was indeed red sighed mrs banker wrapping her shawl round her and now sir i hope you'll humbly forgive me for that's all right mrs banker i only explained myself at length because i am so sick of having my brother's sins imputed on me i hope he paid your rent oh yes sir he did that regularly indeed sneered franklin then he is more honest than i gave him credit for being because if he had not paid you i should have done so you seem to be a decent woman and a widow murmured mrs banker hoping that he would give her some money 
but this mr franklin had no intention of doing you can go now he said pointing with his stick towards an ornamental bridge that is the best way to the high road and mrs benker if my brother should return to you let me know and the police sir she faltered i'll tell the police myself said the man frowning good day mrs benker rather disappointed that she should have received no money and wishing that she had said walter franklin had not paid her rent crept off a lugubrious figure across the bridge franklin watched her till she was out of sight then took off his hat exposing a high baldish head his face was dark and he began to mutter to himself finally he spoke articulately am i never to be rid of that scamp he said shaking his fist at the sky i have lived in italy in exile so that i should not be troubled with his schemes and rascalities i have buried myself here with my daughter and those three who are faithful to me in order that he may not find me out and now i hear of him that woman she is a spy of his i believe she came here from him with a made-up story walter will come and then i'll have to buy him off i shall be glad to do so but to be blackmailed by that reptile no i'll go back to florence first he replaced his hat and began to dig his stick in the ground i wonder if morley would help me he is a shrewd man he might advise me how to deal with this wretched brother of mine if i could only trust him he looked around i wonder where he is he promised to meet me half an hour ago here franklin glanced at his watch i'll walk over to the elms and ask who this woman mrs benker is he may know all this was delivered audibly and at intervals giles was not astonished as he knew from mrs perry that the man was in the habit of talking aloud to himself but he was disappointed to receive such a clear proof that franklin was not the man who had eloped with anne even if he had been deceiving mrs benker which was not to be thought of he would scarcely have spoken in soliloquy as he did if he had not been the man he asserted himself to be giles saying nothing to his companion watched franklin in silence until he was out of sight and then rose to stretch his long legs morley with a groan followed his example it was he who spoke first i am half dead with the cramp said he rubbing his stout leg just like old times when i hid in a cupboard at mother medler's to hear black bill give himself away over a burglary ay and i nearly sneezed that time which would have cost me my life i have been safe enough in that summer-house but the cramp ouch it seems i have been mistaken was all giles could say so have i so was mrs benker we are all in the same box the man is evidently very like his scamp of a brother no doubt morley but he isn't the brother himself more's the pity for franklin's sake as well as our own he seems to hate his brother fairly and would be willing to give him up to the law if he's done anything well said ware beginning to walk this walter franklin to give him his real name has committed murder i am more convinced than ever that he is the guilty person but i don't see what he has to do with anne her father is certainly dead died at florence ha morley franklin comes from florence he may know he may have heard morley nodded you're quite right ware i'll ask him about the matter huh the ex-detective stopped for a moment this involuntary confession clears george franklin yes he is innocent enough well but he inherited the money said morley it's queer that his brother according to you should have killed the girl who kept the fortune from him it is strange 
but it might be that walter franklin intended to play the part of his brother and get the money counting on the resemblance between them that's true enough but if george were in italy and within hail so to speak i don't see how that would have done why not come to the elms with me and speak to franklin yourself he will be waiting for me there no answered ware after some thought he evidently intends to trust you and if i come he may hold his tongue you draw him out morley and then you can tell me mrs benker i'll say nothing about her i'm not supposed to know that she is a visitor to rickwell he'll suspect our game if i chatter about her ware we must be cautious this is a difficult skein to unravel it is that assented giles dolefully and we're no further on with it than we were before nonsense man we have found out wilson's real name well that is something certainly and his brother may be able to put us on his track if he asks about mrs benker say that she is a friend of my housekeeper you can say you heard it from your wife i'll say no more than is necessary replied morley cunningly i learned in my detective days to keep a shut mouth well i'll be off and see what i can get out of him when morley departed at his fast little trot he got over the ground quickly for so small a man giles wandered about the priory park he thought that he might meet with the daughter and see what kind of a person she was if weak in the head as mrs perry declared her to be she might chatter about her uncle walter giles wished to find out all he could about that scamp he was beginning to feel afraid for anne and to wonder in what way she was connected with such a blackguard however he saw nothing and turned his face homeward just as he was leaving the park on the side near the cemetery he saw something glittering in the grass this he picked up and was so amazed that he could only stare at it dumbfounded and his astonishment was little to be wondered at he held in his hand a half-sovereign with an amethyst a diamond and a pearl set into the gold it was the very ornament which he had given anne denham on the night of the children's party at the elms the coin of his most gracious majesty king edward the seventh End of chapter 14 Read by Céline Major